what you were doing with your company was semantic data integration. Can you explain what that means in two sentences? Well, apparently not. <laughs> um, the Google engineers are saying that you are the best in doing this. And then our target market from just financial services all of a sudden became all industries. Thank you, Stan, for, for being here and taking us on the journey of Colibra. Yep. And like with our other speakers, we always like to start a journey, not at the start of the company itself, but at the start of your own personal journey. For you, the first uh, job uh, was to work for an, an IT company. Um, how was that first experience? And uh, you told me you only stayed there for one year. So, uh, you know, many of the people here are going into the job market. How do you choose which company to work for and how do you choose to stay or to go? Um, so, you know, with a degree in what I had in engineering and computers and artificial intelligence, I found essentially a local software company and they built software for the uh, supply chain industry. And I started there and I did like the company. I think they had a lot of opportunity and I think they're still around and I think they're still doing well. But then I stumbled on that opportunity to join a research lab at the University of Brussels and I became a re research engineer there. Yeah. And you said that it was very interesting for you because sort of a, a world opened up, at, at least intellectually. But sometimes also progress depends on luck and really the opportunity that led eventually to uh, the company that you have right now came by the stroke of luck that you were sitting next to a phone that rang uh, and you happened to be there and it was somebody who, who got the idea of why don't we create a spin-off. So in this case, in the lab, you know, we had the benefit. Again, my world opens bigger. The, the environment I was in was very multidisciplinary. You know, people from NLP, linguistics, computer science, and so on. So you, I was seeing and learning a lot. But the environment that I was in, the lab specifically, also had uh, an entrepreneurial spirit. I, I, it's always hard for me to explain it, but it smelled like there was opportunity. You know, there was more that you could do with data to make data better and to make it more meaningful. Then, then we would be able to realize inside the lab. Uh, and I was used to picking up the phone, right? Because, you know, you're, you're working in a computer shop, you pick up the phone if a customer calls. Whereas many other people in the lab, when the phone rings, they just let it ring. So anyway, I picked it up. And then indeed, there was somebody from industry, from a packaging company who called us and said, you know, we, I've been studying you online, your, your research of the lab. And I think with what you have, with the technology you have, we can actually solve the problem of data integration, you know, the, the communication between computer systems, like the ERP and the CRM. We can do that in a more efficient way. And I sort of said, well, sure. That became a catalyst point indeed for uh, four people in the lab, Felix, Peter, myself, and Damien, to say, okay, we can actually do something more. And we started on a journey of one year from mid-2007. And you start a company. Exactly, to start and, a company in 2008. You know, this is for people who are, of course, uh, researchers. Uh, you get the idea, we're going to create a company, but yeah. of course you have to then incorporate the company. You have, yeah. to get, you have to put in some money. And for you, that first round, before you really start to look for outside investors, you say there's a round where you get, they call it the friends, family, and fools round. Uh, because only your, your family or fools would invest in the company. Yeah. Um, but you and your, your three co-founders were foolish enough, but actually smart enough uh, to put in that first uh, money that was about, what, 15,000 euros per person? Yeah, that's right. So indeed, uh, when, uh, whenever you get uh, very early stage money, before seed, I would say, that's friend, family, and fools. But when you do talk to those friends, and you, when you do talk, talk to that family, as in give me some money, you know, the fools is another thing, they're fools, right? So, <laughs> but you have to make it very clear that this is, as our chairman of the board at the time called it, in French, argent perte, or lost money, essentially. So your family and your friends have to know if they give you, I don't know, 5,000 or 10,000 euros, whatever the amount, uh, that it's very likely that they will not get this money back, that this is lost money. Uh, so I made a loan with my father um, to say, you know, uh, one day you'll get the 15,000 back, hopefully. Yeah, and now we know that he got it back, but it wasn't sure at the time, of course. Um, and especially, it was hard to explain also what you were doing, because I wrote it down, because I can't remember it like that. What you were doing with your company was semantic data integration. Can you explain what that means in two sentences? 
Well, apparently not, because we failed to actually make that work. Uh, so semantic data integration is all about, you know, again, those computer systems and making them speak to each other, in which large enterprises spend millions and millions of dollars. So, and we thought we had a different and better way of doing it, and we call it semantic data integration. Um, and we went to the IT people and said, you know, with this, you can actually do it better. And the IT people were looking at us and they were saying, well, you know, first of all, we're already solving this problem. Second of all, I have to learn something new. And third of all, it looks like you're making our jobs obsolete. So they didn't want to buy it. And then we went to the business people and we said, here's a better way of doing uh, data integration. And then the business people were saying, well, first of all, I don't get it. Second of all, why would I bother with doing data integration? I only care about the business. Uh, so we were sort of stuck between a rock and a hard place with our position as a company. And you have to do something and you have to change yeah. the perspective of your company or the way that the company builds products and put yep. them in the marketplace. And you said a couple of things really helped. Uh, one of them was we changed uh, our offering uh, and also we got into the business somebody who was actually good at selling. That's also important. That's correct. You know, when we started our company, we didn't really know anything about anything. We were very young and very naive. We especially didn't know about enterprise software. We didn't even know about enterprises because none of us had actually worked in enterprises. But nine months in the founding of the company, we did realize, well, we're not actually selling anything. Why is that? And then we realized, okay, we're missing talent in our founding team. And we found somebody um, who became our VP of sales and marketing and a co-founder. And that really helped us you know, to organize and structure and bring process to how we went to market uh, with our offering. It probably took us a good year of very heated internal discussions before we actually said, well, let's forget about the semantic data integration position and instead let's position ourselves in data governance because we believe this is the future and we believe that the business will have to take ownership, will have to take responsibility over the asset which is called data. Yeah, and now you've done that, yeah. but you say you know, there's a downside to that too because if you go into a market that exists and in which there are already many players, your challenge is to get a piece of the market. Yeah. But if you say, I'm going to create something entirely new, yeah, then you have to create the market. But there's also an, ad an advantage of that. Could you tell us a little bit more about uh, that uh, situation? Yeah, if you follow your own, it's like, oh, let me build an Instagram for X, right? Like an Instagram for Spain. That's, you know, you're following into an existing category because people already know what it is, but you're just bringing some differentiation to it. Yeah. And then you have to follow a certain strategy. But when you create a category, uh, you know, it's easy to become the market leader or the thought leader in this category because, you know, nobody else is in this category. Uh, but your challenges are very different because uh, one of the things you have to do is now you have to explain something which people don't know they actually need. You know, people don't really know where to position you, they don't know why to buy you, so you have to do a lot of explanation, you have you to do call a lot it of evangelization. Yeah. Evangelization. Now, of course, again, sometimes it's also a matter of luck or you could call it foresight. Yeah. Because what, one of the very important things that happened while you were creating this category was a certain regulation, a global regulation was put into place and that said, guess what companies, you're gonna have a lot of data and you're gonna need data governance, you're gonna need a chief data officer. And that was really a blessing for your company. Yes, indeed, that regulation came out in 2012 and indeed forced all the globally and domestically systematically important banks uh, as a reaction to the crisis, it forced them to be more responsible with their data, to be better, to better be able to explain you know, why things went wrong. So they all had to have a chief data officer and that was you know, our main buying champion. But the first four years of our company, 2008 to 2012, Although we were doing business, we were not seeing a lot of growth, right? So we were seeing some success, some progress, but nothing earth-shaking, right? Nothing was really significant. It changed in 2012. And then our target market from just financial services just be all of a sudden became all industries, right? So your target addressable market goes from this to this. And um, you can imagine how as a business this is very promising. It means you have a lot of opportunity ahead. And for the investors in our board and for new investors, this was also very promising for them because it meant that they, they had a possibility to achieve those higher returns. Yeah. And then, of course, you really get, again, on that expansive growth, that, that explosive growth. Now you are becoming a successful company. And 
not just that, but very recently, mm. you managed to secure the status of a unicorn, which, is, which means that you were valued at a billion dollars or, or more. How did that come about? Um, well, early stage investments, uh, as the discussion just heard, is very much about the team and the vision. Late stage investment uh, is all about numbers. You know, because you have a successful business, people can measure your long-term value with the customer, cost, cost of customer acquisition, and a whole set of other metrics. Uh, so late 2018, uh, Calibra was not necessarily searching for money, but when you have a successful business and you're a leader in that space, the investor's risk capital knows how to find you. Right? So they, we actually had multiple parties that came to us with interesting offers. Uh, and then when Capital G, which is the scale-up investment arm of Alphabet, Google's parent company, they also were one of those uh, opportunities. So they came to us with almost an offer that you couldn't refuse, right? Plus they were saying, well, the reason why we want to invest in you is those nice numbers, but also because the Google engineers are saying that you are the best in doing this. So we were also a little bit flattered, of course. Plus, we knew that uh, in our space, data management was going to commoditize in the cloud with Google and Microsoft and um, Amazon. So we already had a strategy for cloud. So for us, that all sort of came together. And we, quit. we then you know, we looked at the offer. And we said, OK, we get additional capital into the company. But then you also have to think about what are you going to do with this additional capital? What brings the future for Colibra? Um, well. Uh, you know, we created this category of data governance. And, you know, uh, so in 2014, we saw the big data space come up, which is now also already a little bit old in, uh, in trends. Uh, but then we added a, a capability called the catalog, which was more about offensive uh, data strategies. How do you make money with data? And over the last couple of years, we added privacy capabilities for GDPR, for CCPA, and others. So we have the data regulation that has come into place, yeah. especially in Europe uh, and also in other places. For, exactly, yes, correct. Everybody knows it. I'm assuming always everybody always knows it because of the many checkboxes you have on websites right now. Um, but it became a mouthful. You know, Calibra had to explain that we're the, the market leader in governance and, uh, and um, privacy and catalog. So essentially what we did this year is we realized, well, our category that we created is actually bigger than we had originally anticipated. And as of this year, we started calling ourselves the data intelligence company, which sort of groups everything that we're already doing, but also groups the things that we have ahead of us. And does that mean that maybe instead of a unicorn, you can become a decacorn, 10 times a unicorn over? Uh, well, um, if people want to call us that, <laughs> then they can. For us, this is not an objective. Yeah. We just want to make sure we build a good business. We just want to make sure we help you know, make data meaningful. And if people want to call us a unicorn, they can. Well, I think that uh, you've given us a very good explanation of what uh, uh, Colibra looks like and that we've all gotten very inspired uh, about your business. So I want to thank you already for uh, this.